All right. Well, Roniel, thanks for uh, hopping on today. I'm really excited to talk with you more about what you're building and what you're interested in and uh, the future of the world. Um, for folks listening, you run uh, Audius, which is a really cool crypto project that directly connects music producers, music artists with people listening to the music. Um, how do you explain it in your own words, the, the structure of the, particularly the structure of the compensation from mu music to people paying to listen to the music? H how does the uh, economic portion of the project work? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me and um, i excited to be here. So I think you hit the nail on, on the head there at, at a super high level. Audius is a digital streaming service that connects fans directly with artists and exclusive new music. Um, that direct piece is really what we see the key difference between Audius and you know a lot of the other music distribution tools being. And the way we achieve that is by being fully decentralized. So there's this network of um, node operators and, and artists and fans that have come together to kind of cooperatively run this, uh, uh, this streaming network for the benefit of the community. So um, how that leads into the economics and, and your question, um, it's, it's, uh, it's really neat when artists and fans are able to engage directly with one another. Um, artists for the first time using Audius get pricing power around how they wanna structure the way they monetize. I mean, even things like uh, uh, to draw kind of a, a you know, a, a crude comparison um, on, on something like Spotify or Apple Music or something like that, right? As an artist, you get paid out whatever they say you're meant to get paid out, right? Um, there's a big black box that all the money goes into and there's a formula that those companies run and then they pay out what they pay out and there's not a whole lot of understanding or transparency around how that happens. But more importantly, as an artist, you don't get the ability to actually set prices. So um, so that's where Audius is different. Um, and more broadly, I think, you know, decentralization becomes so interesting, right? It gives um, it gives uh, uh, creators of all types the ability to own the relationship with their fan and and monetize that relationship in any way that they see fit. Mm. Yeah, it feels like a natural extension of the <clears throat> early crypto and blockchain applications from just currency to innovating on uh, IP share, right? If you think about music, isn't that w what's going on is people are producing IP, in this case, an audio file, and then there's a question of how do I distribute that audio file in a way where I can receive something back. And so at Audius, do you view the core technical um, overhaul or the work, the, the effort that you guys have put in? Is it mostly around the uh, ability to set your own parameters as a music artist and, and people uh, opting into that? Or how, how do you view the... Um, how do you describe the engine that you've built so far? What was the hardest part in getting to this point, technically? Yeah, yeah. So I think the the hardest part of getting to to where Audius is today was really getting the first version of the network like functional, scalable enough to handle more than like a few hundred users, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, today, the network serves uh, uh, over 6 million users every month and, and around 250,000 artists. Um, so it's it's uh, been cool to see all of that growth happen over um, over two years. But yeah, the, the biggest hurdle I think really was just getting the first version out the door and, and getting it stable enough to, you know, not be a piece of crap, right? <laughs> like, yeah, which yeah. in the early days it, it was, but our community, um, the community that rallied around this uh, was so genuine and understanding and kind of actually helped uh, uh, fix these issues, right? That, um, yeah, it, it, it um, that, that really was uh, the most challenging period, though. Like, um, and, and that was, I think, where the most doubt was in the early days from uh, the world about whether this could work, right? It was like, uh, is this even technically possible? Uh, will latency when you try to stream something be terrible? You know, so on and so on and so on, right? You can you can uh, enumerate your doubts, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, the the uh, the growth that we've seen has been really phenomenal, and I, I think it really pushed the community to 
overcome a lot of these technical challenges along the way relating to scaling a decentralized system that, um, that yeah, just hadn't ever really had to um, uh, have been dealt with, right? Um, mm. it, it's just a, uh, it is like a, a consumer product running at, at uh, a meaningful scale, uh, but doing so in a fully decentralized way, it's just not been, uh, not been really possible. Yeah. I, I want to dig into that if you're, uh, if you would, um, when it's fully decentralized, where are the files sitting? So in the typical like Spotify way, I'm sure they have a CDN, you know, network where they can deploy the, the music quickly, but they have some, presumably some canonical single source database of all the tracks in their library, uh, which they probably you know, will host on AWS or some other cloud service. Is that, how do you, how does Audius by contrast um, facilitate the hosting of the files? Yeah, it's actually um, uh, hosted by these nodes on, on the network. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone can run a uh, Audius node so long as they meet the minimum requirements, um, but you can actually get paid by the network in exchange for doing that. So, um, so let's say, you know, you say, oh, I have this server. I want to, you know, make a little bit of, uh, 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 extra income with it. Um, I'm going to register it as a node and, and set it up. Um, your server actually starts to host fragments of content from, uh, uh, the network via this, um, kind of, uh, linking layer called IPFS. It's a, uh, decentralized file system, but. What's really neat about IPFS is it, it lets you look up information from uh, uh, the world without knowing where it is. So as long as you know the hash of a file, you can query IPFS and say, um, you know, I want the file that matches hash XYZ, right? And there's actually a way for the network, the IPFS network that is to figure out where is that content, but IPFS doesn't solve for you keeping it available. So that's what the Audius nodes that are part of the ecosystem do. They actually pin it and keep it available in uh, IPFS. You can kind of think of this like a, a decentralized CDN of sorts. That's that's sort of the function that um, uh, this layer is is kind of fulfilling in in the system. So all of the content is is living in those nodes. Um, the metadata around the content actually lives on chain on uh, Ethereum and Solana and this uh, Ethereum side chain called POA network. So um, when like, I, I think the best way to kind of uh, uh, kind of wrap your head around this is to think about what's the life cycle of a track, right? So like, Mike, if you go on Audius and upload a track, right? You're uploading that track to one of these nodes on the network, it does a little bit of processing and returns to you a, um, a a hash of the file pinned on IPFS. Then your browser actually goes and submits a transaction on chain to declare this content is mine. Um, and and uh, the last step in that is once that's been published and included on chain, um, the other node type in the Audius network, this uh, discovery node, it's called, think of it like an indexing search service. Um, it watches what happens on chain and would see that, oh, there's a new piece of metadata added to the network. It actually fetches that and indexes it. And then now, um, you know, me as a user, if I go and search, hey, I want to listen to content from Mike, uh, uh, Mike Townsend, right? Um, I would actually you know, discover it via that discovery node. And when I click play, my browser would fetch it from IPFS and play it back. Um, so I know that was a lot, but mm. hopefully that kind of uh, encapsulates like the end to end flow here. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it sounds very, uh, very convoluted, but it actually you know, works, works quite well in practice and it enables this to be fully decentralized. Yeah. So, so in, in reality, the songs, the files for the songs are, are hosted on many different nodes, many different servers that are set up independently of each other, hence the decentralization mm -hmm. of the project. And those, um, the reliability of the song to be there when I click play as a, as a listener, as a consumer, that's what Audius is doing. So you're effectively are you using the Solana network to verify that the songs, is it sort of a uh, like web scraping tactic where you're just verifying that the songs are there periodically? 
because someone could, if I host a a hundred files or a thousand, hundred thousand files on my node, on my server, and I'm part of the audience network, if I drop out uh, and there's not Mm -hmm. other nodes that are also hosting duplicate files, then does that introduce a, um, a problem? You know, when I go to play a song as a consumer, would that song not be there? Yeah, it, it does introduce a problem, um, but the Audius network solves for it uh, uh, today by basically maintaining three copies of every piece of content on the network. And if um, any one of those three becomes unavailable for an extended period of time, the network actually detects that and rebalances it. So um, uh, there's kind of this availability requirement that a node is is meant to to meet. And if a node fails to meet that, um, all of the content that's on that node will actually get rolled off onto uh, onto other nodes using one of the two replica copies. So, um, uh, uh, so yeah, you're it, the the network's able to compensate for for that sort of thing happening. In practice, it's quite rare. Um, mm. We have had rebalancings happen, but um, they're pretty infrequent. Um, I mean, on the order of like a few times a year, I, I think we've seen this um, state happen on the network. But um, but so far, you know, things have uh, things have worked out OK. And, um, you know, the 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 base need, though, that the network has is for there to be this kind of ever growing amount of storage available because more people keep showing up and creating mm-hmm. accounts and uploading content and doing these things. So um, so that creates some very interesting dynamics because the storage requirements grow over time uh but so too does usage and as a result the profitability of being a node so the kind of the network's budget to effectively spend on uh nodes uh on on the network through that revenue sharing mechanism i mentioned um effectively increases in proportion with usage Mm -hmm. um so so there are some interesting kind of uh 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 you know like system design questions that go into how you actually create the incentives around this and, and make it work and and uh you know also worth worth noting i think um all of these things are still works in progress by the community uh, but so far things things have been working quite well mm. I, in my head i heard you say worth noting which i had to laugh at uh on the on the nodes um is it possible now to run a profitable node by using a cloud hosting service? Like if I were to spin up AWS, fresh new account, and I go and create a node on Audius, is that, because I would think that that's just too commoditized. You know, you're paying Amazon's prices, anybody could do it. Um, is that, how are you seeing, the, if you are able to see into the node network or even talk to folks, uh, who are the types of people who are running nodes profitably? Yeah, it's uh, uh, so so. Answering your question pointedly, it, it uh, certainly is possible to uh, uh, to run a node on AWS or a network like that profitably. Um, and uh, uh, the reason a market equilibria hasn't been reached, where effectively it becomes like barely profitable or right. borderline unprofitable to run one of those is because there's a capitalization requirement for a node. So as a node, you actually have to put up a bond of um, 200,000 Audius tokens to be able to join the network. So the dominant cost there is actually like cost of capital, not uh, uh, the actual compute to, to run the node. Um, but the dynamics there end up meaning that it's folks that are, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, wanting to uh, be exposed to the token and and um, wanting to, you know, like run a node really as a professional business. Um, they are seeing that upfront capital um, uh, requirement as, you know, being like, okay, right? So, um that has created an equilibria where on an ongoing compute cost basis, it is quite profitable to, to run a node. Um, so it, it, the question around profitability really comes down to like, what's the cost of capital for that, uh, that token baseline requirement. Mm. And w- so right now, I think you guys, Audius is uh, 0.8. So pretty close to $1 per Audius token audio. Uh, so roughly, if you call it like 180,000, somewhere in that range, 180,000 US. 
why, how did you choose that? Is that dynamic and why do it in the first place? Yeah. So, so, um, we didn't, I mean, we, we, uh, our team suggested this number, but the community voted it into, um, into place. It's not dynamic. It's fixed today. Um, though it is meant to be dynamic in future, actually, it was just something that wasn't implemented in, uh, in the, the kind of V1 of the network. Um, in the, the way that it was determined, it was really trying to model, uh, uh, in their, under different kind of conditions, like what level of uh, profitability could be reached, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of um, making sure that under uh, under like scenarios that we thought were like plausible, uh, that it would still make sense for someone to to want to run a node. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it, it was just I guess sort of a modeling exercise, but at some point. Uh, you also don't like you really don't know how uh, something like this will perform in the real world. So um, I think our uh, our community took the leap of faith and said, hey, we'll, you know, we'll try this, see what happens. And, mm. uh, uh, you know, there were there were levers available to course correct if if it wasn't working. Right. But um, but it did end up kind of playing out uh, according to the models. And uh, I think, you know, for that reason, it's it's uh, it's it's um yeah, it, it, yeah, it's been quite successful so far. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead and pick that pick that guy up if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These things are so loose. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, maybe they changed the shape. Uh, sorry, I guess we'll have to edit that piece out. But <laughs> oh no, no, we'll roll with it. Um, how long have you been working on this now? Uh, four years. Yeah. So, so uh, the project got started in early twenty uh, eighteen. And, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah, know, we're, we're here recording this in, in, uh, early 2022 now. Um, it's been, uh, it's been a crazy four years. Um, but actually it kind of tying back to your question around what was the toughest technical challenge. It took two years or, or a little under two years to even get the first version of the product out the door. Um, so, so we're sort of, um, uh, uh, we recently crossed over, I guess, having more time with the product in the network live than not live uh but that was only quite recent actually uh, uh i think the um the growth we've seen over the last 18 months to 20 months that the product and and the network have been live has uh has really blown all of us uh all of us away we just didn't expect things to move so quickly but um you know when it uh when opportunity comes knocking you don't uh, uh you don't turn it away so um, our community, I think, has has really done a good job of scaling with the demands of all of this extra usage, extra um, engagement, everything else. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious on the community. So um, it's funny. I started a crypto trading company at around the same time in 2018, and we we allowed people to trade uh, uh, gift cards and vouchers for. Uh, Bitcoin as a way to on-ramp into uh, crypto. And building the community was something that we thought a lot about, worked really hard at, um, eventually backed off the concept largely because we were much more of a platform than a decentralized mm -hmm. exchange. Um, how did you go about building a community? Certainly setting up Discord, setting up Telegram, hiring a community manager to do ask me anything are you are there certain things that you found to be more impactful or meaningful in building a, a a useful productive community definitely yeah um it's a fantastic question and uh uh i think really i nor uh, uh anyone on our team like on that original founding team can can really claim credit around this i think the community really emerged organically around what we were doing um the first uh a little bit of press that audius got um brought uh, uh a bunch of folks showing up you know in in our uh team's inboxes saying hey like we want to help how can we mm -hmm. help uh, so we started to try to figure out, well, you know, how can we organize these folks? How can we create structures that allow them to be helpful? Um, and uh, uh, there was someone who emerged from uh, uh, from that community, a, a guy named Michael Cullen, who who now full time runs the the Audius community. But he was 
he emerged from uh, from that early early community, and and really the credit lies, I think, with with uh, with him and with the broader uh, community moderation team. That's the uh, uh, and and you know that's that's kind of uh, fleshed out around him. Um, it's it's been uh, it's been really incredible to kind of see. But um, I wish I could tell you it was more <laughs> deterministic than that. Um, we have a Discord that folks congregate in there's uh, uh telegram channels as well there's a reddit so all the kind of typical channels you would think of are, are there but i think our realization was that um community has to kind of come about organically um it's really hard to to force it or to like buy it which people try to try to do often by like paying some uh, 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 you know, like some, uh, uh, community manager up front to try to manufacture a, a community. Um, I just don't think that's the way these things like work and maybe our experience is different from others. I, I don't know, but, um, uh, uh, it's, yeah, for us, it's just really been this organic sort of, um, sort of thing. I think there are now over 30,000 people in the discord. Um, there's, there's, uh, uh, a very significant number on on Reddit, in Telegram, and in uh, a few other channels as well. Um, but that early kernel of like that first, you know, fifty folks or twenty five folks that were just like, I just think this thing's cool. I want to be involved. I, I want to try uploading my music. Um, I want to give you guys feedback and like help you make it better. Um, all of all of that really just you know you can't you can't force it and those people self-select their way into uh uh you versus the other way around right if you're having to convince someone like hey you should join our community you've almost already lost the game right what you want is for five of their friends to already be there and then for them to uh, uh be told by them about it and and show up and and hang out um but that that doesn't solve your chicken and egg problem in the early days in the very earliest days for us it was just that like i said a little bit of press got enough of the message out that you know of the however many people read that press there's some very small percentage that read that and were like wow i really resonate with this and i need to like be part of it and and creating a path for those people to be a part of it rather than saying like go away um i think that's i think that's really it yeah and i think even press is is probably not the reason that's just the moment that the you know the 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 can was opened like you it's really yeah. about i feel like it's it's about product market fit timing it's like th this is just the right idea at the right time where mm -hmm. crypto was four or five, six years old in, in terms of like really becoming the awareness was up. Then the price spiked in 2017. People were into crypto as just the coins itself. And sure, there's some functionality happening, but really that was like the moment. Oh, this is this is big. And, and there was a huge learning. I feel like 2017, more people learned about Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, you know, name all the coins and tokens and the ICO boom. And more people were talking about the economics of uh, uh, currency than ever before. And mm -hmm. then you start to think, okay, great. We got money down. What's next? And certainly the NFT explosion is one obvious case for what's next, but music to me sounds, it's just the same thing in different format instead of, you know, a, <laughs> instead of obviously the, the visual format of like a JPEG, it's a audio format. Do you see that as being true? Do, do you see it as like just another format between NFTs and audio, or do you see them as distinctly and categorically different types of applications? Yeah, I think uh, from a, a technical perspective, yes, uh, I see them as media as media. Different forms of right. media uh, have to right. be treated differently uh, on on the engineering side, but otherwise you're just moving moving bits around and trying to permission who can access the bits, right? That's, that's really what like all of these mm -hmm. boil down to those two questions, right? Um, now, uh, uh, on shifting to like how you actually think about uh uh building the product the community everything else um music is and, and also how those follower dynamics work music is super different from visual art and and um i think those differences just begin with scale 
um, typically a, uh, a musician has uh, a, a much, much larger number of fans um, than like a successful visual artist, for example. Um, but those fans monetize at, at a lower rate, right? Um, uh, whereas, you know, you as a, as a visual artist can do great with like 20 fans of your art, right? Because you're producing one piece a month maybe. And, and uh, uh, as long as one of those fans wants to buy it or you're plugged into the right galleries or, or things like that, um, you, can, you can do really well, right? Um, in music, historically, music has always been a game of, of scale, right? Um, it's, it's reaching a very large audience and then finding a way for um, that audience to, uh, uh, to be monetized at, um, you know, a, as, as high rate as possible, but realistically, like, on an annual basis, you're drawing in, you know, on, on the order of cents per, per fan in that, in that fan base. I think what um, crypto has done to that dynamic, though, is, is sort of made, uh, uh, created a path for musicians to behave more like uh, visual artists, right? Where if you are um, issuing music NFTs, for example, you could have, you could make a great living serving like 20 or 30 or 50 fans the the level of commitment of the fan matters more than the number of fans and that is a very key shift um mm -hmm. and and this is actually a shift that's been playing out in the music industry over the last 15 years um as as the monetization schemes have shifted away from recorded music being the primary way that an artist is making money um to touring merch um all of these other channels um, the, the average artist you talk to today makes more from those other channels than they do from their actual recorded music being distributed. Um, and, uh, uh NFTs are, is kind of like the most extreme version of that, right? Where you could monetize a very small number of people at an extremely high level. The way we see Audius fitting into all of this is opening up a spectrum there, right? You should, as an artist, be able to offer different products at different price point spectrums. Um, and uh, uh, as things stand today, all music is treated the same and all streaming is is kind of, um, you know, paid out at, at an equivalent rate. Um, but as an artist, what if you wanted to be able to target a given piece of content at a smaller portion of your audience, but then maybe charge them more to access it? Um, it you start to think about like, experiences, if you will, like buying and wearing merchandise or going to a concert, um, those things could be digital too. And, and that's just never been possible because the digital channels to reach fans don't give artists a level of control to, to actually experiment with these things. So, um, so it's a, it's a really fascinating um, uh, kind of set of dynamics here. But I think in, in that sense, uh, uh, music will, I, I think, will remain a game of, um, uh, of, of scale over the very long term. But uh, the way that you can build your way to scale and then also the way you can more effectively monetize by hyper serving like that top segment of a fan base um, rather than saying all fans are the same. Right. Uh, think about like your favorite uh, uh, band or, or music producer or rapper or whatever it may be you would probably uh, uh, pay like a substantial amount of money if you got to listen to their album a month before the, the general public did. Um, or if you got to uh, uh, get advanced access to their concert tickets and get the best seating. So um, I think that, you know, just, just creating the structures to, to actually allow artists and fans to engage directly at scale is what opens up all of these possibilities. Yeah. So interesting. I, I really appreciate that idea. Do you see potentially um, music as a loss leader or like a freemium model where I give, where artists, are, are, tell me if you're seeing this in practice or if you think that we're headed this way, where artists say, hey, take my music, it's absolutely free. And then if you like what I'm doing, uh, purchase my merchandise. And I see that happening now, but certainly it seems the way that Spotify, iTunes, Amazon music is structured. They're really, I mean, Spotify is not selling me clothing. They really seem to be about the subscription model month over month. And then 
that's it. As interestingly though, I saw a, um, I think it was a YouTube video that showed the, the comparison between Chinese, uh, music distribution sites and American or Western, uh, distribution sites like, like Spotify, where in the West, these sites are super clean. It's like 1499 a month, sign up one button, click play. That's it. And in China, the way that they're structuring is much more like, um, you know, by contrast, it would be on YouTube, you'd have click to purchase the merchandise, click uh, to upgrade to premium chat, to be inside the inner circle, click to have this access. Uh, and you're constantly buying these little like micro upgrades throughout the entire experience that you're on there. And I think a Amazon does this now through um, Twitch. They have a lot of these little like in-app upgrades. And to me, it seems like the granularization of the monetization is that the trajectory maybe on the product side for Audius, or do you see that being true for people listening to music, people making music, that it, things become more granular, it, it, that instead of just listen to my music, go to my show, it's like there's 50 different ways to subscribe. There's 50 different ways to <laughs> – certainly there's a there's a limit to that. There's a, a number of things at which it just becomes excessive, but you know, buy a coffee mug with your favorite artist on it. Um, get sunglasses that they wear, get the, buy the shoes, get the hats, get digital, all the digital assets. Does that make sense? I, it does make sense. Uh, and I do, I do see things moving that way. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're right. There's a, a limit to, to that. Right. Um, um, but I do see the process of monetizing fan engagement being far more granular than it is today. Right, where you kind of are bucketing fans into a few really massive buckets rather than being able to segment them more more narrowly. And um uh yeah, I, I, I definitely see the this shift is already playing out. Like mm -hmm. I said, I think the you know the the um uh majority of artists you talk to today are making more from their touring and, and merch and other channels than they are from their actual music um and and to your question too like that freemium kind of approach i think does start to make more sense uh, uh in that world um because you know there i mean i i uh, um i know an artist in our community that has a few million people listen to his music every month on spotify um, and he has 150 or 200 people subscribed to his Patreon. Um, and he actually makes more from those 200 people on his Patreon mm. than he does from like millions on Spotify. Um, so the logical conclusion of that is like, if, if the music is a loss leader to bring people into my fandom that I can monetize in these other ways, uh, you would price the content at zero or closer to zero. Right. Um, but, but like I said earlier, um, I think this is the broader trend that I, I see playing out. Um, Audius doesn't have a horse in that race. Uh, uh, the, the approach um, that the network takes is to give pricing power to the artist. Um, but I, I suspect that the dynamic there will actually mean artists effectively uh, varying price kind of wildly, right? Um, their hits, I think they'd actually want to be free and freely accessible such that uh, the greatest number of fans can hear them and can, it's almost like sourcing the top of funnel, right? Like getting fans into the top of uh, top of funnel through that free, the free hits, right? But then some small percentage of those fans will be like, oh my God, I, I just love this uh, artist and I want more. Um, then they can stumble onto those paid, like mm -hmm. maybe you could hear a, a recent live performance from them if you uh, subscribe to them on a monthly basis or, or do things like that. So um, to your point, I think the, the, the biggest risk in that model is the amount of fragmentation you create yeah. because it's just, it just, it's just a messier um, user experience from a user end user perspective. The Spotify model is about as clean as it can get, right? Because you're paying one flat fee, you get everything, um, uh, but uh, uh, there is a, a growing and meaningful segment of fans that is looking for deeper engagement with their favorite artists. I think the distinction here is 
the number of artists that a fan would probably be engaging with in this way is like counted on maybe one or two hands. It's not like I, as a fan, am going to go subscribe to like 500 of my favorite artists directly on an ongoing basis, but I will subscribe to a few of my favorite artists and, and, uh, maybe I could be one of those 200 Patreon people or, or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. And I think it's important to emphasize the, the importance of the quality of the content, right? It's like you could, we're talking about different ways to offer like side upsells, you know, like t-shirts, coffee mm -hmm. mugs, exclusive access. Like it, it really, it's all circled around what's the, what's the emotion I feel as somebody who's listening to your content that that's really, I mean, artists know this, I, I don't have to preach to them, but I, I do think it's worth emphasizing that people will follow the great art. It's like something baked inside of human beings where we just need uh, music. You need great art to live. It's like not even an option. So that's, it's exciting. Do you see um, the number of artists growing on, uh, uh, on, Audi on Audius coming away from Spotify? Or is there a shift happening where I would assume now if I'm making music, I'm just putting it everywhere? Or is there some macro economic effect that's uh, pulling people out of centralized services? Do you see like five years, 10 years from now, it'll just be decentralized option and centralized option? Or is this more of an evolution towards, it's just going to be all decentralized at a certain point? Yeah, I, I think uh, I don't see this as being zero sum. Uh, the folks who are using Audius today, uh, the vast majority also use Spotify and, and SoundCloud and other channels. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think the way Audius complements those existing channels is by creating an avenue to engage those super fans more deeply. Um, so the way artists are kind of using that channel is to upload content to audience that maybe they uh, either don't think is polished enough for a super public release or, you know, didn't make the cut for an album or whatever it may be, right? There are a lot of different reasons artists will choose not to release something to the masses, but uh, they could release it to, um, uh, to, to their more highly engaged super fans on, on audience. Um, and that engagement and usage model is not at all cannibalizing uh, uh, usage that's happening on other networks is actually quite the opposite. I, I think artists see this as found revenue, uh, uh, revenue that they, they weren't able to, uh, and, and engagement that they weren't able to generate on other channels. Because if they diluted their mass audience with uh, uh, some of this, uh, that would potentially alienate them, right? Um, uh, so, you know, if, if you're uh, a fan, you know, a, a kind of light fan, if you will, or like a less engaged fan of a given artist, you probably like a few of their hits and you listen to them every once in a while on some bigger playlist. Um, you're just a very different segment of their audience from from that super fan. And and Audius is, is very squarely directed at serving that latter group. And And I think as a result of that, there's really not there really aren't others um, in the space serving that segment um, uh, at, at any level of scale today. So, um, so yeah, all, uh, you know, so, so uh, uh, to your question of where the future of this goes though, um, it's, it's really hard to say. I think history in the industry tells you that every 10 to 20 years, uh, the way that music is monetized is remade um, going from, you know, radio to LP records, to cassette tapes, to compact discs, to iTunes, you know, buying individual tracks, to streaming, to who knows what's next, mm -hmm. right? But we are kind of very squarely in like late stage of streaming, uh, uh, if you will, being the dominant kind of monetization model um, as people are becoming increasingly unhappy with uh, uh, the all you can eat um, uh, streaming model on the artist side, but I think it's also important to recognize like the great work that was done, um, by those early, uh, uh, early pioneers on streaming because the, the, um, the broader music industry was, was in a really bad place before streaming. They just were not able to, uh, uh, sustain their themselves because of 
piracy and and so many other issues that that meant uh you know, people just weren't really buying music. And uh, the all-you-can-eat streaming model fixed that problem. And and that's a really incredible and important achievement. Um, so so the downsides of streaming should not uh, uh, take away from the incredible achievement that, that it, it created. But that said, there are streaming that one size fits all model, I think is great for the mainstream fan. It's, it's not, not, uh, not like adequately valuing uh, the super fan. And, and I think that's where there's an opportunity in the market to, um, to better segment a fan base and then to hyper serve those fans that are spending the most money on you as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially going after Patreon's cake yeah which good <laughs> um how about other forms of, of content we're doing a podcast now uh are there podcasts will there be podcasts and then other types of content on top of that i'm sure uh you know if i if i think about other audio content um recorded speeches come to mind podcasting is certainly a big one spotify you know and joe rogan's deal was a, a very big deal and it seems like these platforms are moving into podcasting because it gives them a, especially if they do a unique, uh, exclusive deal, it gives them a library that's bigger than the co competition because it seems like these all you can eat models, which I like that phrase, it, it's getting really commoditized. They have the same library of the same artists virtually. Um, so they're trying to layer on exclusives. Is, is that in the audience's playbook roadmap? Yeah, uh, uh, so podcasts certainly are. Uh, there's actually a, a thriving and rapidly growing podcast sub community within Audius. It's it's much smaller than the music community, but uh, uh, it is growing very quickly. Um, it, you know, part of the reason why uh, uh, that came later, I think, was uh, that early on the product didn't serve uh, uh, podcasters as well. I mean, even just simple things like in uh in the music player if you're listening to a podcast you probably don't want there to be like a next track and a previous track button you want there to be like a skip 30 seconds forward button uh uh or or uh, uh things like that even you know being able to search for only podcast content uh, uh rather than searching you know a mix of music and podcasts right so um, there were there were a lot of like little touches that needed to be made to better support that use case. Um, but the biggest one of those was a few months ago, or maybe this was six months ago. I can't recall exactly the timeline, but um, a few community members in in the Audius ecosystem built a tool to auto import a new podcast episodes from an RSS feed. So um, you know this is this is nothing uh, nothing new for you, Mike, but for for the audience listening, uh, the way that most podcasts are published is through these um, RSS uh, uh, feed structures. Basically, there's a a um, uh, constantly updated uh, uh, feed of new episodes, and that feed gets plugged into the various um, uh, uh, outlets for podcasts everywhere from you know, like the iTunes podcast library to Pocket Cast, the app to, you know, on and on and on. Um, so for the first time, you could actually connect an Audius account to a already existing podcast publishing workflow such that episodes just end up there too, um, which is great, but it's a, it's a start. Um, I think uh, uh, the um, uh, where things get much more interesting is when, let's say, as a um, podcaster, you could offer like a you know paid form of your podcast that you know there's some you know some uh, 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 portion of your episodes only get released to that group. Um, there's a lot of these same models I described around music apply equally well to podcasting. Um, but the boundary I will draw is Audius I think seeks to serve audio um, as as a as a media category, not uh, video you know, writing, uh, blog content, uh, eBooks, any, anything like that. So, um, I think that is a, that is a, um, key distinction and this kind of, it gets back to our, our earlier discussion of, um, you know, the kind of the, uh, uh, technical differences versus the kind of product dynamic differences of serving different forms of media. Um, the, uh, um, 
yeah, the, I, I think the the uh, the sense among our community is that there's there's enough uh, uh, interesting problems to solve exclusively in the audio domain, and uh, the dynamics around the product just change way too much to serve other forms of, of media. It's just very different. Um, but uh, I think a lot of the theses that I just shared about why Audius makes sense and why this direct artist to fan engagement model um, uh, is, is the best way to utilize those super fan relationships. I think those apply equally well to, uh, uh, to other, other forms of media too. I mean, what if you were, um, uh, uh, I don't know, like a Harry Potter fan, right? And uh, you could get like an extra chapter of the book from JK Rowling if you like, you know, paid her directly a, a larger amount or, or something like that, right? Um, these sorts of, I, I think the, the same issues apply, which are that uh, uh, it's difficult today to segment fan bases um, of, of any form of, of media or as any type of content creator. And being able to segment better means you can target better and being able to target better means you can potentially start to create new product offerings for your um, uh, or, or new media offerings, I guess is a better way to put it for different segments of your fan base. Mm. Do you see other projects doing that, creating uh, either audio book type decentralized economic models like Audius or video, any projects that you think have, have hit critical mass that you admire? Uh, on uh, at least like audio books or eBooks or things like that. I haven't seen anything, uh, 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 you know, that, that closely resembles that, but you know, I, I may be ignorant to, uh, uh, to, to some great interesting work that's going on there. Um, on the video side, I think there are a few coming at this from different angles. So, um, there's, there's this project called Theta that's, that's kind of interesting. It's I think like decentralized Twitch. It's not so much, a mm. like, um, uh, uh, for hosting video content to be listened to. It's more directed at live streaming. Um, but it, that's an, that's an interesting, um, project. I, I don't know it super well, but I, I do know, you know, that's, that seems to be their broader thesis. Um, there's also uh, a project called Live Peer that I really like, um, and the founders there are great. It's a it's a great uh, project. They're actually it is it is decentralized, um, you know, effectively a decentralized CDN for either live video or you know, recorded video. The um, uh, uh, the really interesting insight they had though was it's I think the value prop for them is actually directed at significantly reducing cost for transcoding and for bandwidth consume distributing the content. Um, so that's uh, a little different from from uh, what I was describing as like the value prop that I think makes sense for these independent creators to be able to reach their fans and segment fans better and on and on. Um, but yeah, there's I, I really can't think of. Um, Many others. Oh, uh, uh, actually, Mirror is mm. one other one that comes to mind. So it's a decentralized blogging platform. I think kind of like a, a decentralized medium mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, and I'm sure I'm, again, all of these crude analogies I'm giving, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm sure would would not be what how those folks would describe their products. So yeah. I encourage you to go actually look at these products uh, uh, rather than you know, but I'm just, just trying to get across in as, as few words as possible what they do. Um, I think mirror is also very cool. It gives you the ability to, uh, you know, to, to issue NFTs of, um, you know, given pieces of long form writing. Um, and then I, I think I, I imagine, you know, where, where that starts to head is being able to like gate access to certain, you know, blog posts or things like that based on whether someone uh, is supporting you or holds some of those NFTs or, or things like that. Mm. Yeah. It seems like there, there were, we're in this place now where, uh, different projects are, are picking off different file types, right? Like it's, it's the J yeah. it's the JPEG NFT, uh, minting marketplace. It's the Audius who's creating MP3 wave files. And you're, you know, it's not just the file type because there's a certain, because this will be a file type, the same as a, a, uh, a track will, but there's certain categorical 
like clusterings of file types, yeah. like the three and a half to five minute song that you listen to. That's, that's one obviously very popular, but podcasting. And it feels to me also that the number of different file types and the applicability of those is varying over time that, you know, I'm, I might listen to something, a file type that's like a 20 minute song if I'm working, whereas previously it would just be a, a three minute song. And then there's obviously podcasting, then uh, audiobooks. Um, the competition to YouTube and Twitch seem very obvious that I'm sure that that's something that Google is thinking about. How do we, and Amazon, how do we not get displaced? Because it seems to me that YouTube is one of the most, if not the most valuable asset that, that Google has, just given the trajectory of their ability to compete with like Netflix and major content hosting providers. And I'm sure they're not very interested in having those, uh, having that business just be ripped out from underneath them. However, it seems like there is an enormous financial incentive to have that happen. Like the, I, I don't know what the cut is on, on YouTube. Was it 30%, 20, do you know, 25%, some, somewhere in that range, right? I, yeah. But, but, I think that sounds right. Yeah. yeah. It's not 2%. It's not 1%. You know? <laughs> yeah. And granted they've earned it. I mean, they built an incredible platform with incredible design and uh, mobile app and like you, they've gotten to this point in the S curve where they're able to like mm -hmm. ratchet out the revenue because people are creating so much content on there. How many YouTubers are out there? Then, like you said, every 10 years or so, the game changes. And it, it, you, you seem to be like you by Audius seem to be like the canary in the coal mine where there's the shift coming and it's not just conceptual. It's, 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 practically happening. Here's what it looks like. Audio V1, NFTs V2, video is harder, right? It's like bigger file sizes, but it's not categorically different, right? I mean, if you were to start a project tomorrow, doing the same thing you did with audios, but on video, like it's possible, right? You have the same uh, uh, deposit to put down the node. You have the hosting, uh, the same compensation structure, different user interface, right? But Structurally, there's not anything stopping that from happening, right? Yeah, there's not. Um, I think the uh, if history is any guide here, um, video has typically trailed uh, what's happened with audio by seven to ten years, and I think that's just a function of uh, uh, video being yeah. like a lot more data, right? Uh, uh, but like uh, cassette tapes were a thing before. VHS CDs were a thing before DVDs. Um, it's it, I, I, like each of these little shifts kind of happened for music before um, before video, and and same thing here. I think a network like Audius is uh, Audius. I think stores right now about thirty terabytes of, of music, twenty five to thirty, I, I, and uh, um, and that's nearly a million tracks now. I think it's like seven hundred thousand or, or so. Um, the uh, uh, the demand to like the amount of storage that would be needed to store 700,000 videos would be like a hundred times uh, that assuming they were the same length, but compressed audio is just teeny, teeny tiny. It's about a megabyte per minute of uh, audio. And that's at, at like the highest level of, of quality of, um, uh, you know, it's compressed, but it, it's the highest uh, quality of um, compression, like 320 kbps. Um, whereas for video, of course, a minute of 4k uh video even if it's mm. heavily compressed is going to be significantly more so um yeah I, I think that technical difference aside there's nothing stopping someone from doing the same thing in video and uh the fact that for audius uh starting four years ago ended up in retrospect being good timing i think uh there's a good case to be made that we'll see the uh, the the audience of video emerge in the next five years or so. Vidius, um, I'm excited who's, to see it. Who's got vidius.com? I want to check that out. <laughs> yeah, our team has joked about this. Actually, you joke, but I, I think someone on our team actually bought that. Uh, no thing. way! <laughs> because oh, what we're a like, snack. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You were like, yeah, Vidius could be the successor, and then Medius is like all forms of media. Uh, but, yeah. um, it just didn't. It didn't. Uh, you know, we ended up realizing that I think we've we've bitten off uh, uh, more than enough to chew on here around audio, um, and and I think the technical differences are are um, 
significant enough just with respect to storing that much larger amount of data that there probably would be a different architecture to approach this with, um, which means it's probably better off. Being yeah. Separate you know what? Yep. Just throwing some ideas at you from a product perspective. I, I, that came to me when I was diving into it was, okay, so we, they have this like typical way we listen to music, which is we put the record player on a record on the record player, we hit play, and then we just sit down and, and consume it. But now that we're interacting with the screen that we can manipulate uh, anything we want, I could see where the traditional uh, player format changes, where I'm now looking like SoundCloud goes down this road where you have different moments throughout the song you can see the the, the wave format you can see where like the bass drops and people could comment on that i could see it where it splinters off into the artist puts up the if they're using like ableton or logic pro they put up the files itself so i can pull down all the the tracks and i could like remix it you know it's like open source and i could there's this like splintering of different versions of it because now i think when people do that they're they're just doing it themselves like these um you mm -hmm. know they're creating remixes and i could see like a player having the ability to remix inside of it like with its own interface and then people can compensate for that you can offer like comments in line and it can become a much more interactive experience i could see like you you add on a whole not visual component but you add on yeah commentary remixes uh, the community around those individual songs, like what it means, the lyrics behind it. Um, yeah, it does seem like you're just hitting the tip of the iceberg with the kind of interaction you could get from just the, just the experience of listening to the music itself around the player. Oh, oh dude, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you should, uh, should build a uh, Audius client, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and that's something else that's, that's kind of neat here is anyone can build uh, uh, their own client because it's all open source and, mm. and uh, forkable and uh, usable in any way that anyone sees fit. Um, but uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm so excited to see uh, 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 folks explore these different interaction models. Uh, I, too, uh, was back in the day a big fan of the SoundCloud, like, yeah. comment on the time feature. Uh, and, and to your point, just increasing interactivity around the listening experience. Um, there's just so much on... Uh, unexplored ground there um that's that's uh yeah i, I think it, again you know tying uh tying things back like there it's just never been possible really i think for folks to explore these um these different trade-offs and and different dynamics um, but now uh now it is and totally to your point like i think we will see all of those things you described happen over over the coming years and some of them will work and some of them won't and that's fine, right? Uh, uh, consumers like fans will vote with their feet and and use the clients that give them the cool features that that they like. Yeah, can people charge? Like, can I create? Can I fork Audius? Create my own interface for that, my own player, and then charge people like a subscription to use that? Yeah, you could. Yeah, people yeah. doing that. Yeah, uh, no one is today, mm. um, but. Uh, it's certainly possible. Um, I think if you, yeah, if you could build a kind of sufficiently better uh, uh, user experience that folks would be willing to pay for it, or maybe you could, well, actually take that back. What people are trying to do right now, and I think we'll see the first experiments with in, in the coming months is building vertically integrated streaming experiences around a given subset of content. So folks making their own client where if you subscribe on a monthly basis, you get access to some basket of content and you're using their exclusive player, which gives you some you know, mm. cool uh, extra features, things like that. Um, so, that, but I, I guess that doesn't quite fit what you're describing because it's not, it's not people paying for the player, it's people paying for that yeah. like basket of um, experiences. I, I wanna ask you about uh, something else. Um, slight tangent from this, but it just came to me because it's so top of mind with the Spotify Joe Rogan debates. Um, it seems like a lot of the people who are advocates of free speech, meaning specifically free speech for ideas that you don't support, because if you're not in favor of 
free speech for ideas you don't support, then you're not in favor of free speech. So people who are in favor of free speech do not like the idea of private companies taking down music or podcasts based on the ideas that are shared in those podcasts or video or audio files. However, I think most people recognize that these, these are private companies and they can take, they can set their own terms and they can remove them. There's some uh, political debate as to the size of these companies and whether or not they're the only place that you can access uh, these, this, this content. In this case, less so, I think, among Spotify because Amazon and iTunes are significant competitors. It's more so tends to be the debate around um, uh, maybe YouTube and Twitter and Facebook get this. But if someone were to, and if they have already, I, I'd be interested, but put uh, put content up on to Audius that is, for some reason, we're deeming it as it, it shouldn't be allowed to be accessible by people. Um, what, however we want to say that, it's, it's somehow just, it's not just expressing bad ideas, like politically, it's an idea I don't disagree with. It's say the case of doxing someone, I say, I'm going to release your personal address and all your social security and your birth. Like I'm going to put all this stuff out there and I just release it in a song on Audius theoretically. Is there a mechanism for retracting that or how, how would that work? So, and then I, I wanted you to tell me about Audius, but more specifically, as the world moves in this, this direction, what is what's the mechanism in place that uh, that that sh that should operate correctly? And then maybe what sh what should we worry about, too? Yeah, uh, uh, this is a really really interesting set of um, kind of like trade offs and and constraints to to think about. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell I'll start by telling you how Audius uh, as a network kind of approaches these questions, and then how you know where I, I guess where I see that broadly going. Um, Audius as a network uh, uh, does have moderation and it happens at, at two layers. It's um, clients can choose to or not to um, display given pieces of content. And then nodes can choose to or not to host given pieces of, of content. So um, those two kind of mechanisms being available uh, uh, so far have meant that, um, you know, when, when issues of this nature have come up in the past. Uh, uh, to your earlier question, it's not us as a company deciding whether or not uh, a given piece of content should be accessible. It's effectively the community deciding. Like, um, as a node operator, you probably don't want to host certain types of things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if someone reports content uh, uh, like that to you, it, you can stop hosting it. There's a, it, it, you don't get penalized for that as a node operator, mm -hmm. right? You, you get to choose what you host. Um, but uh, if you, yeah, by contrast, um, you know, or, or kind of, I, I guess the, the other side of that um, at a client level, right? Um, and this, I mean, even gets at more, there are more mundane ways that this is useful, right? If someone wanted to build a podcast focused client, you could just say, I'm only going to show podcasts here. Any, I'm, I'm just going to ignore anything that's on Audius that's not tagged podcast. Um, that's one, you know, uh, that's, that's the other lever that the community has today. Um, so what I think is important in those two trade-offs is that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, to, to your earlier point, um, the, the balance our community tried to strike was uh, um, respecting personal freedom on both sides, right? The, the uh, participants in the, in the platform have the freedom to not show your stuff or to not host your stuff. Um, but you as the individual have the freedom to share it um, on Audius. And if you can find someone to host it or run your own node to host it, you can still host it. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think um, it's it's not a perfect solution, uh, but I, I think for us it's worked well so far. Um, and importantly, it means that the community is in control and has a say in how that works, right? Um, if I want to make, you know, like a uh, uh, kind of um, politically opinionated streaming where I only include uh, uh, content from folks whose political views agree with me, I'm totally welcome to do that, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's. 
uh, I can make my own client that does that. Uh, but it's a free market and people may or may not want to use my client. Uh, uh, some folks will, right? They're, I mean, we're seeing this kind of with the exodus from Spotify that's starting to happen. I mean, I don't think this is at any major scale, but there, there are, is a growing number of consumers that are saying, oh, I disagree with the Joe Rogan thing, so I'm going to leave um, Spotify. And irrespective of whether you agree or disagree with you know, both Spotify's decisions in this or those fans' decisions in this, our take uh, as a as the audience community um, has been that you know both of those folks are within their rights to make those choices, um, and that's I, I think that's the best balance you can strike, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, let let people vote with their feet and vote with where they spend their time. Um, but of course, that type of approach doesn't work for a uh, centralized company, right? Because the company does have the ability to uh, uh, make those decisions. And it, by extension of that, they do take the responsibility for moderating um, uh, uh, that content. So, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it, it's I, I think we as a society have still not yet fully grappled with the implications of um, distribution of media being freely accessible to everyone. Um, like, like think a uh, hundred years ago, the only forms of broadcast media that existed were like radio and newspapers and maybe magazines, I guess, if you think about that, right? But uh, there was a very limited part, number of parties that effectively got to control the information that the world saw. And, uh, um, you know, even as far as uh, um, I think it was FDR, right, was was in a wheelchair for for most of his presidency. But there was kind of this unspoken rule among the journalists that they would never photograph him uh, sitting in the wheelchair because it, they thought it made him look weak or, or something. Right. Um, it's it's pretty incredible that, like, the majority of Americans didn't know that the, <laughs> the president was was in a wheelchair. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Like. I mean, I actually kind of think it's cool that the journalists were able to band together and say, hey, we think it's best for the country, even if we all disagree on these sides, um, that, uh, you know, we, we portray our president as a strong figure and a strong presence. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, today, obviously, like, it, inf- there's no one has the ability to control what information goes out, uh, which is just something I mean, even even 25, 30 years ago, that that wasn't the case. Uh, uh, it was increasingly becoming the case through like live TV and, yeah. and everything else. But um, but still, it was a concentrated number of channels of distribution. Now it's like every, everyone uh, can distribute anything. And um, that's what's leading to all these problems around uh, everything from, you know, fake news, misinformation, uh, you know, really awful things uh, in some cases being published through through these channels and, and making it out to the world. So um, I'm not I, I'm not going to sit here and say the the audience ecosystems approach is the perfect approach. Um, but I, I think it is at least one that recognizes the the level of complexity at play here and, and shifts. Um, uh, uh, you know, it kind of tries tries to uh, uh, give more control back to the individual yeah. in that. Yeah, I think if you if you made it, if if you were to sit here and say, Mike, I'm extremely confident we have the perfect solution. It, it seems like you you can't like the perfect solution is one that bends but doesn't break. To have a perfect solution is to be like twitter facebook or you know these centralized services where if we don't like it we just take it down that's the perfect solution it's a perfect solution for them because they have absolute control and i think the trade-off is like hey what's going on here if you suppress ideas that i believe in and you give all the power to them as me as a consumer i don't really like that so then the the move towards decentralization is is incredibly appealing and we're seeing this this swell in that direction the 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 pendulum swings from, hey, these guys in the ivory tower has absolute control over what information gets broadcasted to every individual person. So it's a, it's a more, it's a less orderly structure, uh, but it's less, at least we know it's not going to be um, dictated from a, like an authoritarian perspective. It, it's like the, the chaos will be mitigated when it is decentralize. Yeah, some people will have shitty experiences by having people express anger, but in, or other or other things that are detrimental and past the line of free speech. However, you know, if we all lived in a small town and we all talked to each other, 
how are we going to prevent that from happening anyways? People, people talk and they say what mm -hmm. they're going to say. So I, I think unless you're going to muzzle people and not allow them to communicate at all, then you have to acknowledge that there's going to be an ability that people are going to have digitally to share whatever ideas they have. And so I think an imperfect solution mm -hmm. using like what you said, the nodes themselves choose what they can uh, promote or put on their, on their uh, server. Seems like a damn good solution to me, man. I, <laughs> I'd be proud of that. I don't know that you want to ever move towards like perfect or like, I like the bend, but don't break, you know, have a, a good elastic model. Um, but anytime it gets too controlling, like we know the answer, it's like, who's to say, you know, who's to say what's, what's okay. And what's not okay. I, I think that's ultimately the rub. So, uh, Hey man, couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more and appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Congrats on all the progress. I absolutely love what you guys are building and, and have accomplished so far, obviously enormous numbers with millions and four terabytes of people using it. You've raised 13 million. The token is somewhere around 600 million. Like you're past the point of product market fit and you're now in like hyper growth mode. So Congrats on everything. Are, is there anything you're looking for specifically? Well, I'm sure we'll include links to the communities and Discord and Telegram, but anything specific you want to shout out before we drop off? Yeah, so we, we talked a bunch about uh, uh, community in this episode, both you know the work that the community is doing and how that community formed. Um, our community is always uh, looking for more folks to join and, and we'll welcome them with open arms. So I uh, would encourage you all to come hang out, uh, check things out. If some of these ideas resonated you, resonated with you, uh, we're, we're here to tell you more and to, uh, to, to, um, you know, get to work together. It's, uh, it's a lot more work to be done. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, our, our community is, is really, uh, uh, where the majority of that work is happening right now. So keep crushing it, man. Take care. You too. Thank you.